okay. Um, welcome uh, back to the second part of this day that will deal with uh, regression modeling and machine learning methods for digital soil mapping. Uh, my name is Bas Kempe. I'm working for ISRIC already for five years now um, as a researcher. Um, I'm involved in all sorts of soil mapping projects that often have a capacity building element to them. So I do quite a, uh, a bit of courses uh, nowadays. Um, so as you know, uh, during the spring school, we have some, say, basic introductory modules uh, and some more advanced, more technical modules. Um, and this is one of the uh, more introductory modules um, that basically starts from scratch. Um, so if you already have a lot of, lot of knowledge about regression modeling and, ma and machine learning, then you can sit back and relax, I think, for the next hour. Um, this uh, lecture has two parts. Um, I will explain a bit more about these in, in a minute. Um, I would like to finish the first part before, uh, before lunch, um, but it still might take me an hour, so I'll, I will use up a little bit of time for your lunch break. So we will go for lunch uh, a bit later, and then we um, continue with the second part after lunch. I think that's better than have a break halfway or so uh, in the presentation. Um, okay. Um, yesterday, I think Gerard Heuvelink already briefly introduced uh, regression cridging to you at the end of his lecture and show that by including covariates in your soil mapping model um, you can often improve your, your, your prediction accuracy compared to uh, for instance ordinary cridging. Um, this morning Tom showed you how you could prepare um, covariates and now we're going to take a, a more detailed look at, at using methods for using those covariates for digital soil mapping and then you come to the family of regression cridging or regression models. Um, <coughs> like I said, two parts. Um, so I have I've selected for this, for this lecture, say, so we will, we will discuss, so I'll introduce two different models. Of course, there are many more, but we cannot do them all, of course, during this week. Um, so I selected two, say, more, two contrasting models and also two of the most widely used models in digital soil mapping. The first one is more, say, a more classical model uh, based on, on classical statistics. That was, I think, one of the most popular digital soil mapping methods or models until a couple of years ago, which is linear regression cridging, linear regression combined with the cridging step. Um, so I'll talk about that during the first part of the lecture and during the second part. I will focus on, um, on a machine learning method and maybe already Tom mentioned to you that the machine learning methods, they are very powerful predictors, they produce often good results, and they are becoming more and more popular in, uh, in digital soil mapping. And then especially the random forest model, that will be the model that I will talk about after the lunch. Um, so two contrasting but, but still widely used uh, popular methods for soil mapping. So for linear regression, the first part I will talk a bit about regression itself, about what model assumptions are underlying the regression model. Uh, I will talk about model selection. How can we select a model from a large set of covariates? How can we assess the uncertainty? Um, and also I will tell you a little bit about transformation and back transformation of your data. That is often required um, when you want to do um, linear regression modeling. And then in the second part, like the random forest model, you can apply random forest within the same regression creating framework. Um, so I will ex try to explain to you how to grow a forest of trees, um, how we can um, assess the accuracy of those models. We do it with out-of-bag accuracy assessment, maybe you've heard about it. And we t I will talk a little bit about how can we assess which covariates are important and which are not. And throughout the lecture I will, I will uh, use all kinds of examples from R. So we go, like Tom said, step by step through this modeling process. And everything that, I will, everything that is in this lecture, we will practice with later in the afternoon. So all steps that are in here will come back later in the tutorial. And of course, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will try to, to answer those. So please don't wait until the end. So part one, regression creating using a linear trend model. Um, perhaps Gerard also showed you this, this slide yesterday, I think, right? Um, so on top of this equation, let us say that the general model of, of, of spatial variation, 
which says we have a dependent or target variable, our sole property of interest. At a, in our case, we're dealing with spatial data at a spatial location S, which is a function of a trend, an explanatory part, and then we have some model residual um, that is stochastic and it can be spatially correlated. Um, this model was underlying ordinary greeting and it's also underlying regression greeting. It's all based on the same model of, of spatial variation. Um, but an implicit assumption that we made in, in ordinary creeding, we, we assume that the trend, the M here, is a, is a constant. And then we model the residual with the variogram and we interpolate the residual with, with creeding. And now in regression creeding, we say that the trend M is not, no longer a constant, uh, but it's a, it's a function of explanatory variables, of covariates. And this is an example, a very simple example. Uh, we can say our soil carbon content at location, spatial location S, so S is an X and Y coordinate, it's a vector, is a function of my elevation, my slope at that location, or my vegetation index. And then, of course, this model will not explain or predict the exact soil organic carbon content that I might find at a certain location, so it, it will also be a residual. The organic uh, carbon content that I do not explain with my model. And again, that residual can be spatially correlated and I can interpolate that with creeding, if that is the case. Um, so linear regression, uh, very simply, basically it's a statistical method for modeling the relationship between a response variable and one or more explanatory variables. Um, and this is an example that I, that I took from, uh, from the internet. Um, this is a study about um, skin cancer mortality, so maybe not a very happy subject, but it, it gives a nice illustration. Um, so in this study, they mentioned skin cancer mortality rate, um, and then they were investigating if there is a relationship with latitude. And then the idea is, of course, the closer you get to the equation, the more intense the sunlight and the, the higher the, the, the skin cancer mortality incidence and, and mortality. So what they did, they plotted their observations, they plotted mortality versus latitude, and then they were fitting a linear model to that. So they were investigating, is there, can we model a relationship between mortality and latitude? And then this is the model, it's a linear model, this is the model that they fitted. And this model allows me to predict for each latitude a mortality rate. And you can see that this model fits the observations quite well. There is a very clear uh, linear relationship between mortality and, and latitude. So this line represents our, our model, our regression model. So this line gives me, say, my best estimate, the expected value. I think here I've already explained yesterday what, what, the, what an expected value is. Um, it gives me, for each latitude, it gives me a prediction of, of mortality. And you also see that, of course, around this line, around our model, we have some scatter, we have variation. And I will come back to that later. Um, so multiple linear regression, um, applying it for soil mapping, it has several advantages. Um, models are easy to interpret. Um, the output is quite clear, unlike the output for random forest models, they are more difficult to interpret. Um, Assessment of uh, prediction uncertainty is straightforward. I will show you later how you can, how you can construct confidence or prediction intervals for your predictions. Uh, easy to implement in R, and it's also computationally light. You do not need parallel processing or multiple cores. It, it's implementation is very, very easy. Um, and it's also um, optimal parameter estimation is done with least squares. Uh, the, the model aims to reduce the, the, the prediction error, it's looking for an, for an, for an, optimal, an optimal solution. Uh, and when you did it properly, it will give you the best linear unbiased estimation. So in that sense, also your linear regression model is, is optimal. Um, of course, as with most models, um, at least with most classical statistical models, there are some assumptions involved. Um, for example, um, we assume a linear relationship that can either be positive or negative between, in our case, soil and our, our environmental covariates. And we assume that the effects of the different covariates, you can simply add them together. 
Um, this is an important assumption because you can imagine, um, again, I will use the um, say a carbon example. Suppose I have here my elevation, and I, I assume now there is an, a relationship between my soil organic carbon content and my elevation. Say the higher I get, the colder and maybe more moist it is, and my, my carbon contents will be higher than in, in, in my lowlands, uh, just hypothetically. This is my soil organic carbon. And with this model, we, of course, assume a linear relation between these two. If in reality, your relation between elevation and carbon is something like this, and you model it like this, you'll see that you can make huge errors here. So it's an important assumption that you preferably should check. Is indeed my relationship with my parameter of interest and my covariance linear to avoid huge prediction errors. Um, then there are some assumptions on the module residuals. Um, first of all, residuals are assumed to, to be independent, that they are not related to each other, do not affect each other. And we already know when we're dealing with soil data that often we already violate this assumption because we have spatial correlation. Uh, except when your soil data are collected with a proper sampling design, in this case a random or a probability sampling design, then this assumption still holds. But otherwise we have spatial correlation, so we already violate this, this, this assumption. Um, then the second assumption on the residuals is that is the one of, of constant variance, also known as homoscedacity, uh, um, which means that I have a, I have a, a graph here. Um, that the uh, that say the variation around this line is constant. Right? The residual is is the difference between my prediction at a certain in this case a certain latitude and my observation. This is the residual, and this constant variance assumption assumes that this that the, the variation is, uh, you, you see you have small residuals and you have larger residuals, but in general the variation of the residuals around this line is constant. So the variation becomes a lot larger when you predict at, at larger latitudes. And here we can say th that this, in this case, we, this, this assumption is, uh, is not violated. Um, of course, we see some differences, but in general, the, the cloud is quite evenly distributed. And I will show you an, later on a clear example when we violate this assumption. And it's an important assumption, because if you violate this assumption, you will get problems with your uncertainty assessment, then your confidence or prediction intervals might be too narrow or too small, for instance. And then we assume a normal distribution of the residuals, which is important um, for hypothesis testing involved in modeling. Um, so you should also check for that. And if we violate some of these assumptions that, that we will often do, we need to do something about it, for example, transform our data. Um, and then a, a last assumption is that um, we assume that our covariates or predictors that we use are deterministic and, and not correlated with each other. So they are assumed to be error-free. Um, fitting a linear regression model in R is uh, qu quite easy, like I said. Um, you use the LM function, which is included in the base package. Um, and in this lecture, I will give you an example. I will go through this modeling process step by step using the MUSE data that is included in the SP package. So it's not a data set that you should have on your computer when you've installed R and you've installed the SP library package, then the data is there. So you could easily reproduce also the code in this lecture. So uh, in this example, I'm going to look at uh, the zinc um, um, content. So zinc is my target variable that I want to model and map. Uh, there are several covariates included in the data set, distance to river, yeah, because this is a case study from the south of the Netherlands, by the way. Um, distance to river, because the idea is that the zinc comes from the river and is deposited with river sediments on, on the river banks. Uh, we have elevation data, organic matter content, soil class, flowing frequency class, and lime class. And when you want to do linear modeling and you have categorical or class covariates in your data set, then please be aware that you need at least one observation sampling site in each of these classes to be able to fit your model. 
And if you do not have that, then you need to combine clusters or you have to do something about it. So otherwise, you will run into some errors. Um, then this is the, the, the uh, you can fit the linear regression model with, with one line of code. Uh, the LM function, which says sync, is a function of your list of covariates and you specify your R object that holds the data, in this case, mu's. And then you can ask, it goes very often very uh, quickly, and you can ask R for a summary, and then you get an output like this. Are you all familiar with this output? Or what, is, what is in here? Or shall I, yes, no, shall I explain a little bit? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So what this function then returns, it's a summary of your model. Um, it ret returns the function that you just typed. Um, it gives you a, a statistical distribution of your, of your residuals. Uh, and this is, of course, then the, the main body of your, of your output. That is, this is the model. So here we say, see our covariates. Um, we have a few covariates, categorical covariates. For example, soil class or flooding frequency class. Th th that indicate here. So for each of these classes, you will get a model parameter. So then the, f the, the second column here gives the, the, the estimate of the model coefficient of, the, of the, say, the betas that we saw earlier in the, in the, in the, in the equation. Um, so this column tells you about the effect that each covariate has on your tar target variable, in this case, the zinc content. Then the second column, uh, or, or say the third column, um, gives you the, the, the standard error that is associated to this estimate. And so we are, this gives you, say, the uncertainty about your coefficient, because remember, you have a sample from a limited number of observations in your study area, and you estimate a model from that, from that sample. And of course, when you go out there and take another sample, and you estimate the same model again, your coefficients will be a bit different. You know, each time when you would take a new sample, you would end up with slightly different coefficients. So we are estimating the coefficients based on one sample, but we acknowledge that we are uncertain about this. Um, and for these coefficients, um, we assume see, that these coefficients follow a normal distribution. So the center is your estimated coefficient. And the standard error, I think here I also explained this yesterday, says something about the width of this distribution. So this is our, say, our expected value, our best, say, guess or best estimate based on the data that we have. But we acknowledge that we are uncertain about it because we have, we took only a limited number of samples from our location. So the true beta we don't know, we estimate, but the true beta will be somewhere within this interval. And what, of course, we would like to test here if the coefficient is different from zero. If the coefficient would be zero, then there is no effect of my covariate on my property of interest. And we need this uncertainty information to be able to test that. So if, suppose this is my beta, say beta is 10. Maybe zero is here somewhere. Uh, so it's, it's still quite likely that the true coefficient is, is zero. And that although we measure an effect in our model, in reality, there is no effect at all. So that is what is done here in the second say, part of the table. Um, you see here a, a t value. Um, this value is computed by taking the, taking the quotient of the estimate and the standard error. So it's the estimate divided by the standard error. That quantity is also sometimes referred to as the z-score. Um, and then some hypothesis testing is done with this. And hypothesis testing in statistics involves a, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, A0 and A1. So the null hypothesis here is that there is no effect of the coefficient on my target variable. So my, my coefficient is zero. And we're going to do some statistical testing to accept or reject this hypothesis. And this t-value is used for that. So under the uh, assumption that the null hypothesis is true, then this value follows a t-distribution. 
and you then the model does some checking if this value if the if the t value falls within this distribution and based on that it computes a, a probability so and we see that for some some covariates um, and of course the, the 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 higher the probability the less likely it is that the effect is different from from zero so that there is an effect of, of the covariate and for instance here um, the effect of this soil class, the estimate of the, of the coefficient is 1.5. The standard error is 57. So there's a huge standard error. Um, so there's also a very large probability, almost one, that in, in reality the effect of soil class is, is, is not different from zero. So we cannot prove there is an effect of soil class 2 on my zinc content. And in some cases, indicated by the stars, we reject the null hypothesis that we have enough evidence in our data to reject the null hypothesis that my coefficient is equal to zero or that we prove that there is an effect of this co coefficient or this covariate on my zinc content. And then there is some more information here. Um, we see the R squared uh, indicating the goodness of fit of the model. So this model explains approximately 66% of the variation in my data, which is quite good. Um, and then there is also this F statistic, that's another statistical test. And here some testing is done. Um, so what is done here? Um, a test is done that tests if this model is an improvement over a null model. And a null model means a model without any covariates. And if you do not include any covariates in your model, then your best prediction, you can still predict, would be the mean of your data. So this, this statistic compares the prediction performance of this model versus predicting with the mean of your data. And of course, you hope that with the model, including covariates, you do a better job than with predicting a mean. Um, and in this case, we see a very, very small p-value. So we can, in this case, we reject the null hypothesis that this model does not perform better than, than the, null, the null model, the mean model. Um, so indeed, this model is, is uh, so we, we, we reject the null hypothesis and say this model is a better model, a more accurate prediction model than our model where we would not use any covariates. But this is how you should interpret this, this table. Um, let's take a quick look at some of the assumptions. You see a histogram of the residuals. Um, you can check if the residuals are normally distributed. It doesn't look that bad. It's not perfect, of course, but it never is perfect. It doesn't look that bad. Um, we, can check the, we can check the assumption of constant variance. And we can do that by making a plot of the fitted values, so the model predictions at your data points versus the model residual at those values, which are simply computed by for each observation, for each sampling point, subtracting your fitted value from your observed value. And you see, you don't see what you expect is kind of random variation around this line. But what you see here is that I have this kind of funnel shape, right? And you see here that the variation in residual values becomes larger when my fitted value becomes larger. So here this is a clear example where we violate this assumption of constant variance. The variation in your residuals is much larger for, for large predictions than for small predictions. So for small predictions we are, say, more certain about our predictions than for locations where we predict large values. And this is just an example um, to check, say, this linearity assumption. So I plotted here the zinc content versus the distance to river covariate. And you see here that there, there is a clear nonlinear relationship. Um, so what we can do, uh, we can try to, to, to get rid of the non-constant non variance and also to get rid of this non-linear relationship, we can try to transform our, our zinc data to logarithms, which is what we will do. And another way of dealing with non-linear relationships between, between um, your target variable and your covariate is converting your covariate from a continuous covariate to a categorical covariate. For example, using a technique which they call quantile splitting. And basically what you do is you, you order your, your covariate 
uh, data from low values to high values. And then you take the first 25% of the values, which become class one, second 25% of class two, et cetera, until you have class four. And then use it as our categorical co covariate with four classes in your model. Um, so let's see if we can improve our model a little bit by taking the logarithm. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I think there is uh, one uh, assumption that it's not complete, I would say. That is, we were talking about um, that OLS is a linear unbiased estimator. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we listed the assumptions uh, that make yeah. it true. Uh, one was uh, that covariates are uncorrelated, yeah. and that uh, allows you to have efficient estimates. But one I think is missing was that covariates have to be independent to the residual, with the residual. And the reason is that if you don't have independence, then your uh, estimates are not unbiased anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, what does that mean is that if your covariates are correlated with some missing variable, then the uh, estimates or your coefficients are not unbiased. Mm -hmm. uh, from a predictive point of view, I don't think that makes a big difference. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, but when exactly. we look at the coefficients, then we yeah. cannot really say that those coefficients are the real effects of each yeah. covariance to the target yeah. variable. Yeah. Because w we might not know whether we are missing some variable. And what for, the exa uh, for example, the uh, examples between the mortality rate and latitude, one of, mi of the missing variables could be uh, the state of development of the country. Of, of there course. There is a correlation yeah. between yeah. latitude and uh, development of country. So yeah. maybe that coefficient that we get from the latitude, I mean, the effect of the latitude to the mortality rate might not be embarrassed. Yeah, that, that might be the case. Yeah, in case of, of the mortality example, it's just an example to show, but of course we, we might have effects or sometimes we know, we know that there is an effect of say land management on your organic carbon uh, concentration, but for example land management data is very difficult to get it spatially explicit in the form of a map and we know we are aware that we're missing that information. Uh, but but you're, you're right about, about the, the, the covariates um, and you're also right about having, we are mainly in, it's always good to interpret your model and see if you understand these effects and if these are more say in line with your expectations uh, if you know that there in your study area there's a positive relationship between elevation and, and carbon and you find a negative relationship in your model that that should you know get you thinking what's happening here is that correct is my model not correct but we are often more say um, um, interested in predictions uh, and then um, correlation between or multicollinearity becomes a little bit less of, 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 a, of an issue. Um, yeah, my background is economics, so yeah. we look, for example, at the effect of an increase. Exactly, but then you're really interested the in, in the inference. In, in the yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We look at, really look at the yeah. parameters, so yeah. we take care of this. Exactly. Things, but exactly. Probably in this sense, it's not that important. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's a well-placed remark here. Thanks. Um, so we were back to the to the log transform. Um, so I'm going to it's it's also quite easy to implement an R. I just write log in front of my my zinc variable in this equation. And R is taking the logarithm, the natural logarithm of your zinc concentration, and then it's using that to fit a model. And then you get a model like this. Um, I'm not going to explain this, 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 whole, this whole model now, but we see, for example, that this model, the R squared, was 0.66 and now 0.75. So our model fits the, the, the data a bit, bit better uh, now. So let's take, a, again, a quick look at the assumptions. Um, distribution of the residuals. Um, quite nice. It, it, it follows nicely a normal distribution. Um, constant variance. I mean, it's, it's not... This crop is not, it's not perfect, but at least we see a little bit less this kind of funnel, funnel shape. Um, and also when we look at the relationship between my log sink and distance to river, it's, um, again, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's becoming a bit more linear than it, than it was. 
And then we could even consider also taking, for example, the square root of the logarithm of your covariate to further linearize this relationship. That's also something that we, we could, could do. And that improves the fit even a bit, a bit more. So let's, let's say we, the model might not be perfect, but uh, working with, uh, with the zinc on the log scale for us now works much better than on original scale, so we, we keep that model now. What we still see here um, is that we still have some covariates in our model that are not significant. They don't have a real, we cannot prove there is an effect on the zinc content. And of course we would like to have a model as simple as possible, so we would like to get rid of those covariates. So we have to do some model selection. So model selection is uh, basically it means selecting a statistical model from a set of candidate models. You can imagine that you, from a set of covariates, you can come up with all kinds of combinations that you can include in your model, and we want to select the most, say, the most optimal combination uh, that gives us, say, the, the, the best model possible based on our, our data. Um, so what we do in, in model selection, um, we, will, we try to select the best or most optimal model from all these alternatives. Um, and we do that by observing or trying to observe a principle known as, as Occam's razor, uh, which says that among competing hypotheses that predict equally well, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. So we can translate that also to, to modeling. Huh? If we have two models that predict equally well, we should prefer the, the simpler model over the more complex model. So in order, in order to be able to do such kind of evaluation, we need a criterion. And the selection criterion that is often used in, in, in the literature, there are more, yeah, but this is, this is a frequently used one, is the uh, archaic information criterion. So basically what this does, I'm not going to explain this in detail, but it has kind of two parameters. So this, this criterion, it rewards goodness of fit, but it gives you a penalty for your model complexity. So if you add a lot of extra covariates, uh, so you make your model more, say, um, um, more complex, uh, but if it's only, if the result, if it only results in a very small um, um, improvement in model accuracy, uh, then this criterion will say, okay, this is not a good improvement. Uh, there, there is this trade-off, there's this balance between model complexity and your goodness of it. So it's looking for an optimum, uh, optimum uh, value there. And basically the smaller the absolute value, the better. So, it's, so when we do this, this kind of model selection, we're trying to minimize this, this value. And we could do that here. Stepwise selection, there are also different methods, forward, backward, combined. I'm using the default method here in R. I don't know which that is by heart. Um, you put your step in front of your model equation and then it's applying stepwise selection based on the AIC and it's removing all the covariates from your model that do not have an effect on your property that you want to predict. And then you end up with a model like this. You see that some covariates were removed. I only have retained the, the significant ones. This was my original model. So the model became much more simple. And when we look at the R squared, they are, they are equal. So we, um, we made it simpler without losing any accuracy, which is good. And then you can compare the models. You can ask R uh, or request the AIC from R with the AIC function. And you can see that the first model was about 136, the second model about 132. Uh, lower AC, so that model is preferred over the, the first one. Okay. Then again, we can check some model diagnostics uh, of, our, of our final model. Uh, we can use a histogram or a QQ plot to check the normality assumptions. Um, you can compute the skew in the stat statistic. It should be around zero, then you have a a normal distribution, and a kind of a rule of thumb, when this statistic is less than, say, 0.7, then it is quite all right. You do not have a very strong skew in your, in your residuals. Constant variance, this uh, graph is, is, uh, is about the same as the one that I, I almost the same as one that I showed before. Uh, not optimal, but, but at least it's, it's not as bad as our original, original uh, as in our original model. Um, 
so this, this graph nicely um, summarizes um, my linear regression. So here I have my regression line. Suppose again, I'm going to use this carbon and elevation example again. Um, so this is a model uh, or that models my relationship between elevation and carbon. And with this line, for each elevation, I can get a prediction of the associated carbon value. Uh, the EY, the, S, the expected value, my best guess based on the model. But of course, um, when you go out to locations that have this elevation, you will find different carbon values. So this can be an observation. This is my small y, which is my expected value plus some residual. And the difference between the line and the point that is your, your residual indicated with this arrow. Um, so this is my best guess, my estimate for this elevation. But of course, I will find different carbon contents when I go out there and sample. And the regression model acknowledges that. So it does not only give you an estimate, prediction, but it also quantifies how certain or uncertain you are about this estimate. Because we know in reality we will have some variation. And we can quantify this uncertainty uh, quite easily with, with linear regression. And because of our constant variance assumption, we s assume that the width of this normal distribution, which is controlled by the, the variance or the standard deviation, is the same for, for the whole regression line. So for all elevations, we assume the same uncertainty. So far, so good. Otherwise, raise your hands. So this brings us to the, to the next topic, um, prediction of certainty. So um, basically, we can identify two sources of uncertainty. The first source is uncertainty about the model as a result of unexplained variation in the data because we do not have all covariates that we would like to have, or because just of random noise. Eh? There's always, of course, some, some, some part of the variation will be, will be random. Um, this, this source of uncertainty is often referred to as the residual variance, which basically is the variation that we have here, quantified with this normal distribution. And then the second uh, source of uncertainty is the uncertainty about the mean, about the model itself about this line. Uh, you remember the standard errors in our regression table, right? Which were associated uh, to, the, to the regression coefficients. Uh, they quantified the uncertainty uh, associated to the regression coefficients. Uh, because if we would, like I already mentioned, if we would go out there in your study area and sample again, this line, of course, would be a bit different. Uh, each time we would take a new uh, uh, sample data set, we would get a slightly different regression line. So we also ascertain a little bit about this regression line. So that's the second source of uncertainty. And I will have an illustration of that in a minute. So uh, to compute the prediction uncertainty, uh, sometimes referred as the prediction error variance or the standard error of prediction, uh, it's the sum of these two components. So we sum the residual variance and uh, the, the, the variance of the, of, the, of the mean, of the expected value of the regression line, how we can take the, the square root of the standard error, which gives you the variance. We add the variances, and then we take the square root. And often, what you often have, especially when you're sampling set data set is large, then this will be very small compared to, to that one. And with this quantity, you can compute your 90% or 95% prediction interval. This is very straightforward based on the classical statistics. So your prediction interval is your predicted value plus minus 1.645 times your, your standard error of your prediction. Like I said also in the beginning, quantifying prediction uncertainty Sorry. in, in uh, linear regression is very straightforward. Yes.
Yeah. Large sum of squared errors, so yeah. Sum, sorry, sum of squared yeah, errors. Yeah. Sum of squared errors. Yeah. Do you then divide that by, or do you, square, do you divide it by the, the, the number of your sample size to get to some sort of SE prediction? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you do? Um, sorry, I, I, don't, okay, I, don't, I don't want a specific answer. It's just that what I'm saying is that <laughs> yeah. some, of, some, of the, um, some of the outputs that you get from R in terms of that summary table. Yeah. It it do, it doesn't give you these statistics, but you, but you can obtain them through another way, and I will show you okay. in a minute. So what you get is in the sum of squared errors. So it it computes for each of your observations uh, a prediction. Yeah. It subtracts the predicted value from the observed value. Yeah. That's your error, your residual. You square them, and then you sum them all for your for your uh, uh, for your data set. Then you have the sum of squared errors. And that is used as a minimization criterion. So in linear regression, but also automatons want to minimize that, that, that quantity. Okay. Um, so there, this is, a, say, a, a graph of these different sources of uncertainty. So here I have my regression line. The red dots represent your data. And you'll see you have variation around your regression line. The green line, I exaggerated a little bit. In reality, it, is, it was much, much smaller, but uh, I exaggerated the, 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 the width a little bit for this to, to make it clear. Um, so this green, the green lines represent the uncertainty that I have about this, my regression model, about the blue line. So in reality, my regression line will be somewhere in between these, these, um, these two, um, two lines. Um, then we have the, the standard error of the model, uh, our residual variance, and you see that all my points fall, except a few fall within this. Um, they are straight lines because we assume constant variance, so the variance here is the same as the variance over there. And when we um, square these two standard errors and we sum them, and then again take the square root, we get the purple, the purple line. So the purple line is, my, is a quantification of my model uncertainty based on both, both sources of, of uncertainty. Um, and you can do this in, uh, in R. Um, um, it's also, again, simple implementation in R. Uh, you use a predict.lm function. It's predicting with a linear model. And you add an argument called se.fit se is true. And what, it, what R then returns is, your, 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 is the prediction, and your estimate at your, at your data points. It returns a variable called se.fit, which is the standard error of your, of your um, prediction uh, caused by uncertainty about the model coefficients, and the standard error from my linear regression table. And you see that this uncertainty depends on on your on the prediction. So for some predictions, this uncertainty is a bit smaller than, or the error is a bit smaller than for other predictions. And then the residual scale that is your residual uh, standard deviation. If you square it, you get the residual variance. So that is this guy over here, the black lines. And it returns only one value and not one for each observation because we assume constant variance. So this one is valid for all your observations. Um, I will go quickly through this. You will do this in, in the tutorial. Um, so based on this output, you can compute uh, confidence intervals um, for, your, for your mean. Um, um, you can compute, and here you have here I implemented this function here. So I add the two sources of uncertainty as variances. I square them, and then I get my my prediction interval. And then I can add or subtract these from my from my prediction to obtain obtain my prediction interval. Very quickly, it will come back in the tutorial. Um, so the regression increasing algorithm. Um, I think here I showed this as well yesterday, right? Yeah. So again, very quickly, um, 
five steps, we select a set of covariates that, that we want to use in our model. Uh, and we fit our regression model. Uh, so we estimate our regression coefficients. Uh, once we have our regression model, we can use that model to predict on your sampling sites. From those predictions, uh, you subtract the prediction from your observation, you have your model residual, and you can then fit a semi-variogram to your residual. Um, then the next step is, once we have calibrated our regression model, we can apply it to our covariate stack, and then we and by applying this to our covariate stack, we produce a prediction for each location in our study area based on the covariate values at that location. Um, so then we have what we call a, a trend prediction, a prediction of the regression model for each location in our mapping area. Then we can apply creaging. We have a semi variogram of the residuals. We can creach the residuals to all the grid cells in your mapping area. And then we add those two values together. That's very simply is the regression creaching framework. And we can use a re linear regression model for this, which we can also replace a linear regression model with the output of a random forest model, but the framework remains the same. Um, so this basically is the whole regression creaching workflow in R. I load the required packages, I fit my linear regression model with LM function, I compute my model residuals, convert them to a spatial object, and that is what you all did yesterday, fitted a variogram to the residuals, quits the residuals. Here I predict with my linear regression model uh, for each location in my mapping area based on the covariate values. So mu.fit is my regression model, and I'm going to apply it on mu.grid, which contains the covariate stack. So this gives me my creeps residuals at each location in my mapping area. This gives me the trend or the regression prediction for each location in my mapping area. And I can then simply add them together. And then you have your regression creeping prediction. So this basically is, is it. In case for my zinc example, this is my residual variogram. So I still have some spatial correlation in my residuals, perhaps because I'm missing some important covariates, like you already indicated. So I can do creaching here. Yeah, I don't have a pure nugget variogram. Um, and then this would be my, my output. So I apply my, my fitted regression model to the covariate stack, which gives me my trend prediction, my regression prediction. I creach the residuals to the same location and I add these together to obtain my sync prediction. On a log scale, eh? we, we remember we converted um, our data to logarithms, so we have now our prediction on, on a log scale. So what we need to do um, is, of course, we would like to have our results on the original scale. Eh? That's easy also for communication. So we, what we have to do um, is to, to back transform them. Eh? We want to go back from our predictions on log scale to the original scale. Um, so what you should remember is that you cannot simply take uh, the exponent uh, um, because that doesn't give you the mean of the distribution, but it gives the median. So it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated. Um, so what you have to do when you want to transform you, uh, your log transform variable back, um, you have to take the exponent of your prediction, but you have to add half of your prediction variance to it. This is just based on statistical theory. And then you are back on your original measurement scale. This is just the way how it is done. Um, creating also, we saw yesterday, gives our creating variance, our uncertainty estimate, which also is on a log scale. Um, of course, it would be nice to have that back as well on the original scale. Um, but there are some, uh, that is not trivial. Uh, back transforming your prediction is pretty straightforward. Huh? It's not so, not so complicated. Um, back transformation of the, of the prediction variance is, um, is, is a bit more complicated. Uh, and, in, in th and this depends on the predicted value. So back transformation of the predicted value depends on the variance, but also the other way around. 
And then there are some authors that argue that, that the back transform printing variance is not a good uncertainty estimate because it, it's not independent from your predicted value. Right? It's not an independent measure of, of accuracy. Or independent, it, of course, it depends on, on, your, on your variogram, right? given your variogram. Um, so what these authors argue is that you can better, when you want to quantify the uncertainty of, your, um, of a log transform variable, um, do it by using a prediction interval. Um, and you can obtain your 90% prediction interval. You can also use 95 if you like. I often use 90%. So it's a bit of personal preference. Um, and you ca can obtain the lower boundary of this prediction interval by taking the exponent of your predicted value minus 1.645 times your predicted standard deviation. So this, you just take the square root of your accreting variance, which gives you the accreting standard deviation. You multiply it with this number, and you subtract it from your prediction. And then you take the exponent. And you can do the same for the upper boundary, but then you add this, this quantity. And that gives you the lower and upper boundary of your prediction interval on the original, on, on your measurement scale. And this is, again, an example of... Um, of back transformations in R. So I, I compute the zinc by taking the exponent of my log zinc plus half times my creating variance. And I calculate the lower and upper boundary by taking the square root of my creating variance, which gives you the creating standard deviation, multiplying it by 1.64, then subtracting and adding it to the predicted value, and then taking the exponent. And we will practice with this also in the, in the afternoon. Um, so when I then summarize, I add all this information to my, to my, uh, say my prediction object in R. So when I summarize, I have all this information together. I have my predicted residual, bridging variance on log scale, my trend prediction, my regression prediction, I add it to the same object, also on log scale. Trend plus a creature residual gives you my log zinc prediction, my regression creating prediction back transformation to the zinc content and then the lower and upper boundary. So if everything organized, they're all, all, all raster layers organized in one, one R object. Um, and then this, this is then an example of my, of my of a zinc map on the original scale after back transformation. My zinc content and then 90 uh, the, the lower boundary of the 90% prediction interval and the upper boundary of the 90% prediction interval. Quantifying the, the uncertainty associated to this predicted value. So much more about uncertainty tomorrow in the, in the Geras module. Um, then final topic, so a few more minutes and then we will have, uh, have lunch. Then we conclude this first part of the lecture. Um, there's, uh, there's also, um, so there are different forms of regression creating, and you come across them in literature. Sometimes you use regression creating, universal creating, creating with external drift. And these differences have to do with how you deal with your, your trend model. And I'll try to explain. So, the, um, so these forms of diff two different forms of regression creating, um, they differ in how we model the trend. So in the regression creating, as I just explained it, the, the trend, so the, the linear regression in this case, and the residuals are modeled separately. Huh? I model the trend, I compute my residuals, fit the variogram, and then do my predictions individually and then add them together in the end. Um, but and as a result, that, that I'm a bit uncertain, I saw that, I'm a bit uncertain about my trend predictions. Huh? Re remember the standard error of my regression coefficients. And that uncertainty that I have is not, is not propagated or included in the, in the creating variance of this regression creating. It only includes the other source of uncertainty of the two that we, we just identified. So basically what you do is you underestimate your uncertainty a little bit. Often not that much because the uncertainty about the trend is often much smaller than say the, 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 the residual variation but you underestimate your uncertainty a little bit. And the second um, 
problem that we have is that regression queuing violates the assumption of independent residuals. We have spatial correlation in the residuals. So basically, when we fit a regression model, we should take the spatial correlation into account when computing the regression coefficients. And we did not do that. We took our data, we took them as if they were independent, fitted our regression model, and then continued with our regression queuing. And with external drift queuing or queuing with external drift, um, it's a me methodology or method to to um, to model your your regression coefficients to fit your trend model while taking your spatial um, um, spatial dependence into account. So it's a bit it's a more say a more elegant and less quick and dirty approach to to regression queuing. So what it does it takes spatial de dependence in your data into account when it fits your regression model, and it also ensures that your uncertainty that is associated with this trend prediction also ends up in the creating variance. So it's, it's, a, it's more complete. And there are different ways to do that. Um, I'm not going into, into detail now. Uh, one is iterative generalized least squares, and one is residual maximum likelihood, or REML, that is implemented in the GOR package. Uh, and in pedometrics, especially Murray Locke, um, he's a British pedometrician, um, he did a lot of work on this, and he wrote some very good papers about this external drift, drift screeching. Um, and I included these papers also in the, in the literature. So if you're interested, you can, you can give them a look. Um, queasing with external drift is also very simply implemented in R. The only thing that you have to do is you have to specify your regression equation when you do your queasing. And then R recognizes it, hey, this is not ordinary queasing, this is universal or queasing or queasing with external drift. Um, so then this is all being taken, taken care of. Again, you can do the same back transformation as I showed before. Um, and then you get the output. What is interesting to compare, I have my creating variances here. This is regressive creating as I, as I just showed. This is creating with external drift. And for example, when you, when you compare the two Queasing variances, you see that the queasing with external drift variances are slightly larger than the regression queasing variances. Because now our uncertainty about our regression model is included in here. That's why they're a bit larger. Um, but you see that the trend predictions on the log scale, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't differ differ much. And also when you when you um, back transform to the original scale, uh, when you look at the mean, <coughs> the mean zinc content here for uh, with external drift is slightly larger than the, than the mean over there. So the methods do, do produce slightly different results. So basically, regress increasing is more easy, straightforward to, to implement. Increasing uh, with external drift is a bit more elegant, especially when you do the REML implementation with the GOR package. Okay. That was part one.